guest tonight. I am so honored to introduce Dr. Alice Brunn. She is a ex-pig vet that used to work in the industry, and now she is a full-time animal rights activist. So without further ado, Dr. Alice Brunn. Thank you. Woo! Hello. Um, sorry, I also have some notes I'm going to be glancing at, but um, yeah, we'll be all right. So yeah, I was a, a pig industry vet for four years. Um, and in that time, I had like hundreds of Britain's pig farms under my care. So hundreds of thousands of pigs um, that I would attend regularly. Um, I'm also a farmer's granddaughter. So my grandpa actually farmed pigs and beef cattle and turkeys. Um, and I went into the pig industry kind of a staunch supporter of British farming and eating meat at every meal. Um, and I came out, as James said, a vegan activist um, yeah. with severe PTSD. Oh. And you can kind of see why from uh, the farrowing crate kind of epitomizes all the issues within animal farming for me. Um, my work with pigs actually began long before going to university and qualifying as a vet. So as a teenager, I um, laboured on kind of an intensive breed to finish pig farm um, for six months. And much of that time I spent in the farrowing house with about 500 caged mothers. Um, so I'm just going to talk you through the whole process kind of briefly and my experience of working on farms with crates. Um, and I hope there's at least one non-vegan in here, otherwise I'm really sorry. <laughs> It's not nice, um, and I try, when I'm speaking to vegans, I try to make it like quite uplifting, but I feel like sometimes you really do just have to kind of really look at what is happening to these animals and talk about what's behind the closed doors. So I'm going to do a bit of that today, I'm afraid. Um, so around 60% of the UK sow herd, so around 200,000 mothers at any one time, will be um, caged for about a quarter of their lives in farrowing crates. Um, they'll start being inseminated around their first birthday um, and then they'll keep going through that process for six or so litter, sometimes significantly more. Um, and they're put in to the cage a week before their due date and after their piglets are weaned at about three to four weeks old, um, they're either killed or put straight back round to be re-impregnated just a few days later. Um, these crates as you can see, provide no space for a 300 kilo animal to move around. Um, they can just about lie down and stand up, but even that is with difficulty. Because we think the more time that they spend in these cages unable to move, they lose muscle tone, and they can develop like nerve damage um, and pressure sores because they're on a completely hard floor. Um, and they lose condition because it's such an intensive milking period with so many piglets. Um, and they're lying directly on these hard floors, so it wouldn't be uncommon when you bring them back out the crate at the other end for them to be like really struggling to walk properly um, and for the sores on their shoulders to be so deep that they have to be cold. Um, that's quite a common thing. So they're in these crates for five weeks at a time, sometimes longer. And the only thing they have to stimulate them in that time basically is food, is the eating time. Um, and bear in mind, pigs rank among the most intelligent animals in the world. They have the sort of cognitive capacity and emotional complexity of uh, at least a three-year-old human child. So the only thing they have to do is eat. So when you walk into a farrowing house in the build-up to feeding time, the sort of cacophonous din that they make can be almost deafening. Um, and they can become so worked up uh, waiting for food that I've literally seen sows drop dead from intestinal torsion or liver lobe torsion, so like a twisting of the internal organs from the stress. So the physical damage of caging an animal like this is obviously enormous, um, but the psychological damage really cannot be overstated. Um, I've watched sows basically lose the will to live, I don't know how else to describe it, but just stop eating and stop interacting, sort of lie there staring at the metal feeder and waste away until they have to be dragged out and shot. Um, I've seen countless sows with horrific injuries, lots on recent footage as well. Um, so uh, like torn and infected vulvas, prolapses, 
that are left untreated um, and obviously not euthanized until the piglets are fat enough to be weaned. They often develop uh, behaviours consistent with psychosis, or it's called zoocosis in animals. Um, so much like you see a pacing lion in a zoo cage or a monkey in a lab sort of banging their head repetitively on cage bars, sows will bite the bars that they can access in the farrowing crate until their mouths bleed. Um, they'll bang them up and down repetitively. Um, and if they've got automatic drinkers, they will flood the pen as well, just because there's nothing else to do for them. Excuse me. <laughs> um, because these crates are usually in pens with slats, so holes that go straight down into the slurry underneath, um, because nobody's actually checking, um, they can be provided with no enrichment. So remember what I told you about how, intelli how intelligent they are. Um, Pretty much the best they'll get is a little bit of straw. Often what they'll get is a handful of torn paper or paper shavings. But that's pretty much just to mop up any liquid mess. Um, it's certainly nothing of any semblance to what would be like rooting material or nesting material, which are both really strongly motivated natural behaviours for pigs, um, denial of which causes serious psychological distress. And um, conversely, sows in the wild um, will really carefully select a nesting site. They can walk for days, for miles on end, um, in isolation from a herd, and they assess particular sites or how suitable they are for nesting, um, things like drainage and protection for their piglets. Um, and then they'll craft a nest, which is like naturally supportive for the piglets. The idea is that they roll out the bottom if the sow lies in the nest. Um, so bear in mind, the best thing they're getting is a handful of paper. The most elaborate nest recorded in the wild was about 250 kilos of plant material gathered by one sow to create a beautiful nest. Um, pigs not only use materials to build nests, they um, have been shown to use tools, so sticks for digging. Uh, they can solve complex problems, navigate mazes and remember them, so their spatial memory uh, is already there for navigating mazes at about five days old. They've been taught to play video games. I don't know if anyone's seen the videos of pigs playing video games. Uh, painting pictures, be potty trained, um, obviously searching for things on smell. Um, basically, they're extremely smart, they're very social, very playful, uh, and it's no wonder they go insane on farms. What you can't see um, from this, because we have a very small model, um, what you can't see is that many modern sows grow to be the size of their cage um, because what we've done to them genetically is manipulate them for a better meat pig so they're growing as much and as fast as possible and obviously those genetics go through mum as well um, so not only can she not turn around she's also actually pressed on every side by metal a lot of the time what we've also done to them genetically uh, is breed for prolificacy so as many piglets as possible from each mum uh, wild pigs have around three to five babies and it's now not uncommon to see litters of 20 plus piglets in commercial sows and I think they recorded one over 40 piglets in Brazil recently. Um, which means that although we're also selecting mums for as many teats as possible, the piglets will inevitably be fighting for the best teats um, and they cause facial necrosis to each other and damage to the others. So what do we do about that? Well, we actually just cut their teeth off. So we've got some teeth cutters here, if anybody wants to have a look. Um, we then put them into barren cells in massive groups with nothing to do, covered in their own waste. And as a result, the stress behaviour they develop later in life is biting each other's tails off. So what do we do? We cut their tails off. So we're basically uh, manipulating animals to fit a system of our making. We do all of these mutilations without anaesthetic and pain relief, and that was something I was doing day in, day out for those six months on that farm, um, the piglets screaming as I did it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the majority of piglets in the UK go through these mutilations. It's over 80% of pigs are, are tail docked. Um, what's crazy is that this prolificacy that we've bred for actually just translates to more death, so you don't really get that much better productivity out of it. Because um, obviously piglets are going to struggle to 
thrive in such a br brutal system. Um, and the runts often become sick or they're knocked on the head early on, which is another thing that I was having to do for those six months. Um, it's illegal but very commonplace and I'm still seeing it in footage now, five years out of the industry. Um, you're effectively standing in front of a mum as you swing her baby over your head and smash her baby's head onto the concrete. That is the most commonly used method of euthanasia in piglets. Uh, sometimes I would find piglets strewn about the front of a pen, um, like ripped in half, mangled, dying. Uh, this really only happens in crates, usually in guilt, so first time mums. Uh, when the stress of confinement saw, causes them to savage their own piglets. Um, studies have found up to 15% of gilts do this in some way or another. Just, can you imagine being put in such a stressful situation that you feel the need to rip your own babies apart? The excuse used by the industry to continue using crates is that they protect piglets. Uh, studies have actually shown no statistical difference in piglet mortality, so death rate, uh, between crated and uncrated. And in fact, piglet and sow mortality is 2% lower on outdoor farms than indoor, uh, suggesting the crates are really not protecting piglets. Uh, the reality, I suspect, is because it would cost them a lot of money to change those systems. Uh, pigs are much e easier to handle when they're in a cage, obviously. Um, so the industry will pretty much say anything to prevent any change. This is what I found consistently in that industry. Um, they will buy scientists, they will cobble together the poorest conducted studies you've ever seen uh, to reference in their propaganda. It's like when you hear, um, I'm sure we've all heard it, uh, the dairy industry say that cows are bad mothers so that they can go and take their babies away at one day old, um, when clearly we can see them fighting to protect them, we can hear them bellowing, um, in sadness to their lost children. Telling people sows will crush their piglets unless you put them in a cage. Uh, do we not think that being unable to turn around and see what you're doing, see where your piglets are when you're lying down, um, having weakened muscles from being stuck in a cage, um, and being completely unable to adjust in a cage that's the same size as you would be a greater risk factor for squashing tiny little piglets underneath you on a concrete floor. Um, they're not crushing them in the wild, obviously. <laughs> so there's a phenomenal amount of death on farms, um, 46,000 each week in the UK alone on farms, so not including those that make it to slaughter, 46,000 due to uh, stress, neglect, injury, disease. Um, and that's not including the breeding herd who are being culled out at around 50% a year to maintain productivity. Um, to finish, it, the feeling that kind of stays with me from working in farrowing houses is probably one of the most potent that I carry from the pig industry. It's like really palpable misery as you walk through row upon row of caged mother and like make eye contact with them. Um, and it just feels, when you make eye contact, it feels like they're asking what they've done to deserve it. Um, Unfortunately, the majority of pigs' lives will also end in a cage like this, so being lowered into a gas chamber in a gondola, um, high concentration of carbon dioxide gas, which uh, burns their eyes, lungs, and makes them panic before death. Um, so essentially, they spend their entire lives trapped. I left the industry after four years um, of being banned from farms for flagging welfare issues. Uh, speaking out about the industry since then has seen me under investigation by the veterinary regulatory body um, and censored at conferences on radio, TV, etc. Uh, I became a vet because I love animals and I had to leave that job because I love animals because so I simply couldn't, there's literally nothing I could do to help them all change in a very stuck industry that's focused on profit alone. Um, and there just wasn't a single other person that I could trust to protect those animals in that industry, so, or even speak honestly about their plight. So, um, yeah, just thank you all for sort of standing up for them and being here. Thanks.